So, Ralph Kent, you are once again collaborating with Alexander Payne on Downsizing. Uh, it's a movie that's been long in development. I think you've been hearing about it for about a decade now. So, seeing the film finally come to fruition, what has that been like? Good. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's been, uh, I guess it's been thought about and gestating and all these things. I mean, has it... Um, but I haven't really, you know, I read the script 10 years ago, but, you know, I haven't been, you know, there's nothing for me to, if, if there's nothing for me to work on, then, then it's not like I've been working on it in 10 years. I, um, right. you know, I've been waiting to see what it would actually look like. Certainly it was a surprise. I mean, you know, people keep on referring to it as science fiction because it involves a science which does not yet exist. But um, but it's not like, you know, when you, when normally when we talk, think of science fiction, we've got sort of laser blasters. It, at least I do. I have laser blasters in mind. It is not that kind of film at all. So, uh, but I was, I was, you know, naturally intrigued to see what it was going to look like, what the, uh, the world, you know, um, and, 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 you know, they, they talked about all these special effects that were going to be in it. And of course there are, but they don't feel like special effects. They feel like, you know, making a world believable. Well, that brings up a, a point I wanted to ask you about, which is that the movie is more high concept than what we are used to from Alexander Payne. Um, did that change your ideas at all for the musical approach? But it, except it's, not, it's still a very Alexander Payne film. Um, the, the high concept part of it is sort of, uh, to my mind, a distraction. It's, it's, the, it, it's still very much a social satire, a very, a, you know, very much about you know, the absurdity of human beings and, um, and what we get up to and what we do. Um, so I think it's very, uh, you know, to my mind, it's still very much an Alex, Alexander Payne film. Um, and uh, the way he uh, relates to um, things, I mean, it's, it's, it's so often about the grandiose gestures and, and the absurdity of them. And whether that was an election or Citizen Ruth or this, um, I think it's, it's that, that still seems to be the common uh, thread in Alexander's approach to uh, storytelling. So talk a little bit about your initial ideas for the music. Uh, well, I've, at first I was thinking, um, at the very beginning we're thinking, well, wouldn't it be great to do a very vocal score with tons of voices? And I did lots of experiments with um, uh, very vocal driven pieces of music and um, or entirely vocal. And um, uh, that didn't get traction at first, but uh, we, we did end up with quite a lot more vocal uh, elements in the score to the film than uh, in the past. I mean, the the I, I was I, I was originally thinking of doing a very a cappella score, in, which is not what we ended up with at all. It's very orchestral, um, but um, but we still ended up with you know a, I, I ended up writing arias in Norwegian and um, uh, which sort of feeling, feeling very much like a piece of opera that you would have heard somewhere, and um, there are various other places where vocals uh, feature prominently. Um, one of the other things that happened very early on, I mean, Alexander's sort of original brief to me was, uh, don't feel like film music, feel like beautiful classical music. And um, that idea stayed throughout. In, in concept, you know, I grew, I grew up three miles from, uh, if that, from Stanley Kubrick's house. And um, Stanley Kubrick, as you, we know, had a, a very interesting relationship with uh, music and film. And so uh, there came a point at which we were sort of looking at it as, as a, what I think of as a Kubrickian approach, taking, even though it, you know, Stanley would have used um, pre-existing music, we were, I was creating music that would have felt like it belonged to a genre that, or, that had long existed. So, you know, there's a Hungarian waltz in there, and there is, uh, yeah, as I said, these pieces of opera, and, and using them in the score as if they were sort of found pieces of music, which somehow miraculously fit perfectly. But, um, but nonetheless, you know, that, that idea that there is um, the relationship between the music, the beautiful classical music, and the, um, the film has that sort of Kubrick quality. The other thing that's uh, kind of consistent with uh, this movie and all of Alexander Payne's work is that it involves, uh, you know, ordinary men and women who do extraordinary things. Uh, and certainly that's uh, the case with Matt Damon's character and the way that he develops. 
uh, over the course of the film. Can you talk a little bit about uh, how you expressed his character through music and, and how you expressed his uh, development and his growth? Right, well, um, his theme uh, was one of the very first things I wrote and it's that, um, which is a very light, perky thing. I mean, he's he's uh, he's an ador he's an adorable Midwestern character. He's a little dorky, um, uh, but he, uh, but he's on a path. He's on an extraordinary path, and um, uh, that theme was originally written for the first time you hear it, which is you know he's in this meatpacking factory and he's just walking through, and um, somehow or other it has a has a humanity to it. It has a lightness to it and a personality. And um, so that is r largely why that theme exists. And um, on top of which, whenever, whenever we watched that scene, Alexander would always sort of slightly giggle every time he heard that music against the image. Uh, you know, it's 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 written to to match Matt Damon's walking pace, um, but it has this sort of light skip to it. So um, and, and and it worked great at the beginning. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm slightly thinking of, um, I remember hearing Alan Silvestri talking about the music to um, uh, Forrest Gump and how he had that theme which worked great at the beginning and he kept on trying to put it somewhere else in the film. It didn't go anywhere else and it went at the end. And it's a simply book it, but it, but it's incredibly memorable. You want to hear it twice, incredibly memorable and it bookends the film. There, there is an element of that. I mean, this, this theme does come back. Um, but but never as quite as light and dorky as as it does at the beginning. It comes back, and of course it's it is also the last thing we hear in the uh, against the picture, the very last moment. But then it's matured. It's gone from this sort of happy-go-lucky. I'm not quite sure, you know, what's going to happen with my life um, scenario, which is, you know, when when Paul. Um, Matt Damon's character is at the beginning he's single and and we don't know what's going to happen with him. At the end, he's very much you know made some substantial discoveries and life choices, and he's discovered his own authority. And the music is there much more purposeful. Same theme, much more purposeful, much more. It's almost unrecognizably the same theme because at the beginning it's on a whistle, at the end it's um, sort of a full orchestra and um, has this maturity and this weight to it. And it turns up in little places uh, on, on, along the journey. Um, but that's, yeah, that's Matt Damon's main theme. The film balances a lot of different kind of tones. I mean, it's comedic, it's romantic. Uh, there's some drama and some pathos in it. Uh, how does your music balance all of those things together? Uh, well, I hope. <laughs> well, I mean, how do you, uh, how did you uh, find the correct mix of that? I guess. You know, well, as always, lots of experimentation, um, and, and and it's a, you know, to some degree, it's a picaresque film. You know, it happens in 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 moments rather than in long narrative. So um, that and that gives one license to sort of really indulge a moment. So the downsizing sequence, which is about ten minutes long, and, and through scored. Um, with almost entirely one piece of music, and um, which has to just keep on, keep on building and changing and building and changing and building and changing, and um, but it's very much its own thing. I mean that that motif, that energy doesn't occur anywhere else in the film, but that was uh, it was very much conceived. That whole downsizing sequence was conceived as a ballet, um, not by me, by Alexander. So the music had to sort of live into that expectation that there was a dance-like quality as it unfolds and unfolds and unfolds. Um, but, um, uh, and then of course, you know, one of our favorite characters in the film, Nat Trang, played by Hong Chao, doesn't turn up until the second half of the film. Um, we, uh, we do, uh, you know, I, I, I deliberately hint at her theme in the very opening piece of music. Of, you know the type the when we are seeing the paramount logo got a hint of her theme because we're not going to hear it for quite a while afterwards but I, I you know i always like this idea that you've got thematic material and um and that somehow you're weaving it as a sort of a, a complete tapestry in a film rather than you know just exploring certain moments but that you can sort of make things join together so her theme which uh i i, I um 
you know, she has a, a power, but she's a fragility as well. And um, so, um, and I was, that was very much on my mind. And I, I was, um, and then at five in the morning, I, I woke up with this little cello motif, very sort of softly played in my head and hummed it into, a, into my phone. And that became her theme. And so we hint at that at the very beginning of the opening titles, but um, it keeps on coming back and keeps on coming back. And um, especially it once, once her story really starts being told so that you know the um but i don't want to give any spoilers but you know in the when in, in our, our climactic moments uh, towards the end of the film that theme is 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 played again it's a tricky one as well because it, it's its definition is fragile so when i played it loud alexander was going i don't recognize it and um you know you have this uh um da -da 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 and it was imagined as some very soft cellos. And so when you play it with a fork, it doesn't sound like the same tune. So I had to sort of rearrange it to make sure it was on solo wind, even though the orchestra was playing and everything, so that it sort of scaled down and it felt like her voice was still, still present. But that's it. It's, it's lots of experimentation. And... Um, and, and and you know I'm lucky. I, I write. I like themes. People like me writing themes. And thematic material is great for for um, tying story together. Now you also have an original song in the movie called uh, "A Little Change in the Weather." Tell us a little bit about that song. Well, yes, um, "A Little Change in the Weather" was um, so. There's a so there's an operatic moment in the sort of middle of the film. Um, where, where it's it's sung in Hungary, uh, not Hungarian, and sung in Norwegian, and um, and but the theme is I, I thought the theme was pretty pretty nice, and I was looking at the end titles and and realizing that the um, it wouldn't that um, sometimes the the first thing you hear at the end of the picture makes a big difference to the nature of the picture, the nature of your experience of the picture. It sort of seals the deal in some way, and. Um, I, it's, it struck me in watching the film that it needed to immediately pick up energy. The moment you hit the credits, you want the energy to elevate a bit because, um, because that's, you know, to, to give a sort of, um, to give a push so that when people leave the cinema, the, the exterior, the experience of the film, you know, you have that arc at the end of the film, but then you want it, you want that lift, um, which sort of resolves and ties things together. And that theme, it seemed like a good theme to use. So um, I uh, I wrote some words. I wrote some, you know, you can't have an end title song in, in Norwegian. Well, at least in Norway you can. But, <laughs> um, but uh, um, I thought I'd uh, try and write it in English, which is very, very challenging to come up with, um, uh, well, well, to come up with English words to a, well, firstly, I mean, Alexander's films are sophisticated there um, and they're satirical to a, a large degree. And it's easy to write stupid words and, um, and hard to write good ones. But, um, but I always like this idea, uh, which is very much a James Bond you know, song idea, which, uh, where you take um, a phrase from a film and then repurpose it as a, as a more universal idea. So I didn't want to write a song about shrinking. Um, but, um, but but nonetheless, to use the words about being small and using references to being small. So um, uh, so I wrote some placeholder words, and it turned out they they were better than placeholder words because Alexander liked them, so we kept them. And um, and then I was thinking, who could sing this? Because it was just a piece of sort of fairly operatic musical something. And um, and then I remember that I knew the uh, well, I was acquainted with the Swingles. It's, it's this fantastic. Um, a cappella ensemble in London. And um, so within the swing girls, of course, you've got seven phenomenal voices. So there's a range of possibilities. So um, I threw it over to them. Uh, they wrote two more verses, uh, fantastic musical arrangement, and um, and then recorded it. And, um, and, and I mean, I, I can't arrange like they can arrange, but that kind of brilliant absurdity of uh, that a, a cappella can offer. And um, so I recorded the orchestra, and they recorded the um, the vocals uh, while they were on tour, and um, it all it all came together. And when we were mixing it, the, uh, at first we mixed it so that the 
the vocals lay in the orchestra perfectly and it wasn't very funny and it wasn't very exhilarating and then um, we remixed it with the vocals much much more on top so that you can really hear all the all the you know what the the colors and so and, and suddenly it was very funny again which was what what i was hoping for you've worked with alexander payne now since the very beginning of his uh, career with citizen ruth and that led to election about schmidt sideways how has that uh, collaborative relationship between the two of you grown and changed over the years well um i, th I think there's a huge I, I i think we both trust each other a lot and i think that's the real thing it's um uh, the, the the work hasn't become easier um because it's um of all the people I work with, it, it, it is the most fluid, as in, you know, some directors like to get the right piece of music and move on. And Alexander likes to um, get an interesting piece of music and think about it and keep editing the film and have more music written and then reappraise things, and, and that which, which means it's a, an awful lot of rewriting. So I probably scored this film about two and a half times. Um, because and, you know there's an awful lot of music that's uh you know on the cutting room floor because uh because it, you know we were in the middle of the edit the film was discovering what it was the music was giving opportunities for it to become something and then sometimes they were those were cul-de-sacs and sometimes they took it somewhere really good um but the but but knowing that that is going to be the process knowing that you know i'm back in a relationship with alexander payne in t in these terms and that it is going to be a process um, is important because you know, otherwise you, you know, I'd be stressing like crazy about it. Why is it not working? Whereas knowing that it's just an unfolding process and we explore and we keep exploring. And, and it actually became, this was one of the most pleasurable uh, writing experiences, even though more than half my m music was eventually thrown away. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and for your work on Sideways, you received a Golden Globe nomination. What did that recognition mean for you? I, you know, it's nice to get a nice to get recognition. Um, in, in terms of you know, the fact is that the day after you win an award or, or, or get a nomination, you're still the same person, still with the same issues and problems and challenges. So, um, in one sense, it's great you know it always looks fantastic on the resume and everything um on the other hand um it doesn't really make any difference to life uh, or the process mm -hmm. well ralph kent thank you so much and congratulations on the film i appreciate your time thank you very much you're welcome have a good one